Uh, first, I want to thank Balkem for having me here. I want this talk to be as friendly as possible, as informal as possible. So please, if you have questions, uh, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, my goal today is just to give a um, general overview about what calling is. I'm sure that everyone in this room know what calling is, but I'm going to go and say some details here and there. And I'm going to talk about some of the uh, models that we are using in our lab. Uh, I'm going to show you some new results, interesting results. And again, if you have any questions, please stop me. I decided to start with this um, slide because I want to show you that the research that we do in mouse, the, re the research that we do in other models, it's actually translatable. This means that we can actually use the knowledge that we obtain from one model to apply it to another model. And you can see here why we use mice so often in the lab. We are not so far away apart of, of them. And well, um, even in some labs, uh, there are some avians use uh, some um, type of chickens. So these are different models to understand basic biology. Saying that, I'm going to move to calling. And I'm not going to go through the biochemis deep biochemistry of this. I just want to show you um, choline and the most important metabolites of choline. Um, acetylcholine, this is a neurotransmitter, very important for communication in, between neurons, but also it is very important for muscle. It, the the um, nerves are connected from our brain to the muscle and it's sending signals. So acetylcholine, it's not only working in our brain uh, sending signals, it's also working through our body and through our muscles. Phosphatidylcholine, it's another very important metabolite from choline. Every single cell in our body has phosphatidylcholine. That layer that uh, it's surrounding the cell, it's formed by phosphatidylcholine. And betaine, betaine, it's very important because it's a methyl donor. What I mean by this, um, this is a, the uh, methylation cycle, and it's going to give this group a small molecule who is going to be um, entered into this group, and it's going to form S-adenosylmethionine, who I'm going to talk a little bit um, about it. But this cycle, it's actually connected with folate. And I'm sure that here, all we have heard about the importance of folate and folate supplementation or folate uh, uh, fortification. Actually, during pregnancy, now it's required that pregnant women take pregnant women take folate. So these two pathways are actually connected. Something really interesting is that even if these pathways are connected, are not really overlapping. What what, what I'm trying to say is that even if you are taking folate, it doesn't mean that you are meeting the recommendations for uh, choline. You need both. To, to be healthy and to have healthy cells. So now I'm going to talk briefly about this methylation pathway that I was talking about and why beta in it's very important for this. We have mentioned constantly the word epigenetics. And I'm sure that um, you will hear many more times during um, this uh, evening. And I'm going to be very brief about it. We have the same DNA. If you look below you, the person uh, that is sitting beside you, it has the same DNA, the same letters, the four letters that are forming the code. What is making us so different? Why our phenotype and why how we look like, we, uh, look like it's different? It's because of epigenetics. That means without changing the DNA, Without change, changing the code, on top of the DNA, it's happening something that it's making a gene to express or to not express. So here what I'm showing is the DNA, and this is a methyl group. This is the methyl group that can come from, from folate and also can come from choline. And this is acting as a lock. 
So now, where can we find choline? Because I'm, I'm hoping that I'm convincing you more and more that choline is important for humans, that it has a role in every single cell, that it has different metabolites. But um, where can we find choline? Well, we can find it in meat. We can find it in uh, fish, in some vegetables, in chicken, eggs, milk, and cheese. And I was talking with a group this morning, and we were talking about why we are not eating enough choline. And my answer was, we are doing something wrong. We scientists are, are doing something wrong. Because 20 years ago, we came and told people, do not eat eggs, high cholesterol. It's gonna cause, cause you heart problems. Do not eat eggs, or just eat the whites. What is the consequence? People are not eating choline, and with two eggs, people will be meeting the amount of choline that they need. Now, what is true now, and what a lot of research has been done, it's about if you have predisposition for cardiovascular disease, then probably you need to cut in the amount of eggs that you are eating. But if, if you don't have any predisposition, you don't have to cut the amount of eggs, and you, don't, you won't be choline deficient. But our body needs choline not only from food. Our body is making choline from something called the novosynthesis. And this the novosynthesis means that our body is making choline from scratch. So this is why women are, we are so great, because this gene is derived by estrogen. So when we are pregnant, estrogen is high, and we are making choline from scratch. Let me tell you why. What? Men cannot do that. So it's highly likely that men are more prone to be choline de deficient than women. And of course, postmenopausal women will be choline deficient if they are not eating the, uh, the enough amount of choline because the uh, estrogen levels are going to be low, so it's not going to be enough uh, choline uh, from the novo. So I, I just wanted to show this to tell you that this de novo synthesis is happening also in cattle. And what I did here is to look for the protein, this protein that is in the top of, um, of here, the one that is um, doing calling from the novo. And in these red squares, you can see where are these missing or these differences. So, and I put my own picture here because I didn't want to offend anybody, right? And, <laughs> and you can see that there are a lot of sim uh, its similarities. Uh, we, call, um, we call this actually, um, uh, I, I forgot the word, but these only these squares, it's where the identity, I remember the word, identity. This means that the protein is very similar to the other one. So you can see this phosphatidyl ethanolamine protein it's very similar between, between um, humans and between uh, cattle. So another thing uh, really interesting is that even if you are eating enough choline, you probably will need more. And the reason why is because in our DNA, we can have misspellings. In, remember that I was telling you about these words that are compounding our DNA? Well. There are some misspellings that can make a protein, to, a, a gene, to do not create a protein. So imagine that you have a misspelling in your de novo synthesis of choline. You are not going to be producing that. Now think about this. A pregnant woman, even if she is uh, having high levels of estrogen, but has a SNP or a misspelling in her DNA, it's not going to be making choline from the novel. So it's very important now for us to understand at the Research Institute how, it's in, how your meetings, or how your necessities of food are very dependable on your genetics. It's what we call precision nutrition. Because we were told before, if you eat low carbs, you will be fine. But that's not completely true. Each of us have a very specific genetics that will make us very specific also in the needs in different nutrients. So 
probably now you are wondering if you are eating enough choline or not. So I'm going to show you this. Um, this uh, most Americans do not achieve the enough amount of choline. And you can see here, with kids, it's easier, because actually moms are, um, we are very behind our kids. Drink your milk, eat your eggs, so they meet the amount of choline that they need. However, uh, men, women, and during pregnancy and lactation, uh, in, uh, Americans are not meeting the amount of choline, of choline that is needed. So why is it so important to eat choline? Well, it's essential for brain development, and I'm going to show you some, some results about it. It's important for liver because low um, uh, choline intake is going to lead um, to develop fatty liver. I, I mean fat deposits in your liver. It's important for muscle, and it's important for the browning of adipose tissue. tissue. And I'm going to show you some new results about it. I'm going to start with brain. What do we know about brain? We know that in, um, this is using a model. This is in mouse model. We know that um, in very uh, old mice, choline supplementation makes, um, it's, uh, be, very, it's pretty good for the mouse to remember certain tracks. So it's good, it's good for memory and for cognition. In some models of neurological disease, Choline supplementation improves part of the phenotype. Not, to not totally, not completely, but, but rescue part of the phenotype. Low choline during pregnancy, and this study in humans was done in Harvard, is called the BIPA study. Low choline intake during, during pregnancy reduces the visual memory in children. This visual, visual memory, it's the one that makes you uh, remember if there's a gas station in the corner of a particular place. Or when you were taking classes uh, and the professors were showing certain images that you were associating with the information, that is the visual memory. memory. And this is um, a study from 2016 that showed that only 4% of American women were actually taking the uh, recommended intake. So we decided to know, since, since this is very important for brain development, we decided to use a model to study what was going on specifically in brain. So for that, we use a mouse model. What we did was to uh, time mate um, mice. That means that you know exactly how many days of pregnancy your uh, mouse uh, has. And we feed them with adequate choline and with low choline during a very particular window of time, neurogenesis. The neurogenesis is when all the cells, uh, the development of your um, nervous system, it's going to be happening. So we remove choline only for this window of time. You see that it's a very particular window. So what you're seeing here, it's a staining of the of a embryonic day 17 mouse. What you are seeing here is the very top part of the brain, the cerebral cortex. And in blue, it's all the cells. And here in green, it's the neural progenitor cells. These are the stem cells of the, of the brain, the cells that will give rise to all the cell types in the brain, oligodendrocytes, um, glia, but here, its development. So they, are, they want to make a big, big pool of these cells to have enough for the rest of the brain. What happened in low choline? This is same age, embryonic um, day 17, and you can see that these green cells are reduced. It's, a, 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 it's a reduced the number of ne neural progenitor cells, only removing choline five days uh, during pregnancy. Then we, we ask, what is happening? Why this number of cells are reduced? So what you are seeing here, it's again the cerebral cortex, but we zoom in into that green area. And this colorful picture, it's about the cells that are dividing. All the cells that are dividing to make this pool, to make, uh, to make this pool grow. This is what is happening in low choline. Basically, the cells are not dividing, and this pool is not growing. So, 
we wanted to know exactly how choline is contributing to this phenotype. And remember that at the beginning, I was telling you about all this methylation potential and epigenetics, because the DNA of these two uh, pops is the same. It's just what, what the moms are eating. So we check for methylation potential. So you have, I'm sorry. <laughs> so you have here choline, betaine, and some and sa. This is actually the molecules that are gonna uh, donate the methyl groups. And what you see here, it's adequate choline and in white, low choline. When we measure uh, some in brains, we found that some was reduced. SA wasn't changed, but what it's dictating actually, the methylation potential, is the ratio between, between these two. So we found that in low choline, the methylation potential is reduced. And now what we are doing, it's looking specifically where are these uh, changes happening in the DNA. This is very important, because if we are having even a phenotype in humans, these children that have less visual memory, it will be really important to know if their methylation potential is also reduced. So while we were collecting these brains, we started to, to collect also the eyes. So what you are seeing here, this compact structure, is the retina. And this circle here are the lens. And we were collecting the whole brains because it's how, the process, how, how we process our samples. And we started to observe a different phenotype that we, wasn't, we weren't expecting. A lot of the low choline pops have these convolutions in the retina. And the cells were um, not forming this compact, um, this compact structure. So this can explain partially what is going on also with the visual memory. It's actually the visual memory because it's connected, the, the optic nerve, it's connected to the brain, and it's why they are not actually seeing properly or what is going on. So we had this uh, paper published a couple months ago, but I want to show you also how it looks closer. This is the, the normal organization. These are neurons, neurons in, a, in our retina who are, that are processing all the images, all that we are seeing are being processing by our brains. So, and you can see here, how does it look when a mom was eating low choline or not choline. So, so far I talk about the requirements of choline during pregnancy, but what happened after, after birth? There are postnatal requirements of choline. And in our institute, it was a set of studies trying to figure out if a mom is choline deficient during pregnancy, it's highly likely that, that during breastfeeding, it's gonna still be in choline deficiency. So they used to uh, visual memory in kids six months old, and they were putting some cables here to see how they react to different pictures. And they found that actually choline supplementation postnatally to women who were uh, taking less choline during pregnancy was helping the kids a lot to react to, to remember these pictures. And that was measured by waves, uh, by a software who was measuring waving. Something also really interesting is that it's not only choline. A group of kids who was supplemented with choline and DHA had even better results. So there's some synergism between nutrients. I know I love choline. I will always focus more, more on choline, but it's very important to have other nutrients too that are acting together. So actually, this is just to show you that now in some um, human milks, they are putting together choline and DHA to, to meet the, the requirements. And this uh, basis of this research was done at the Nutrition Research Institute where I worked. So now I'm gonna uh, move, I'm gonna switch topics, no more brain. I'm gonna show you some results from, um, from muscle. We observe that men who were putting to uh, exercise, to high exercise, they were biking for an hour or they were running. And then they, they gave some samples, blood samples, urine samples, and they, they um, wrote down what they have been eating for the last weeks. The results um, showed that actually males that were eating less choline 
were having high levels of ALT and, a and LAD. That, that means that, that there, is, there are muscle break, muscle break. So it's very important to understand that even when you are doing for exercise and for exercise recovery, we need to be meeting the amount of choline. And that SNPs, again, misspellings in our DNA can make us more susceptible and we need to eat more choline. So um, now I'm gonna focus a little bit in, in, in betaine. And the reason why I'm gonna focus on betaine is because it has a very interesting phenotype in one of our mice um, models. And I think that you might find it, find it also interesting, I hope so. So we have a knockout model where we remove BHMT. BHMT, it's the next step. So you obtain choline from the diet that it gets converted to betaine and then BHMT, it's the one who is gonna make the betaine enter to the methionine cycle and to the uh, methylation um, cycle. So we did a model where we, we removed this, um, this gene. What we observed with these uh, mice after six weeks was that the body weight was reduced. The uh, pops coming from BHMT knockout, not having these genes, were smaller. But actually, when we measured the adipose tissue, it was also reduced. It was not fat. They had more muscle. They were smaller because they had more muscle. And then we took some pictures about the, um, we took some samples of adipose tissue. And here you can see a BHMT wild type. These are adipose. Now, for those who are not familiar what an adipose is, an adipose, adipocyte is a cell that is specialized in a storage fat. So that fat that is white, that abdominal uh, fat, it's full of adipocytes. What happened in the BHMT knockouts? The adipocytes are reduced, are not having this deposit of, um, of fat. So we wonder why it's happening this. Why the BHMT knockouts, um, they high, have high choline and high betaine, but it's not being trans transformed. Why they are having these small adipocytes? So there's this uh, phenomena um, probably uh, many of you are familiar with this, but it's called adipose browning. What does it mean? Is that from this adipocyte, that it's a f it has fat storage, it's actually receiving different signals. It can be hormones, it can be cold exposure, like here, I'm not a big fan of cold. And then the cells start to behave different. They stop storing fat and are becoming brown-like. And what I mean by brown-like, it's more muscle. So what is happening here is that these cells, instead of storing fat, they are getting rid of, of that fat, and now they are becoming more like a, mu a muscle type of cell. So there are uh, certain signatures of that phenomena. There are certain, gene certain genes that start to express when this is happening. So we check for these uh, uh, genes, UCP1, um, adiponectin, and they were up in BHMT knockout. So this means that high choline and high betaine, it's actually removing the fat, it's moving this to a brown adipocyte, and it has all the signatures of adipose browning. So, just a um, reminder, if BHMT is not working, it's not gonna enter to the methionine cycle. It's not gonna be a methylation process. What it's gonna happen is that it's gonna build up on homocysteine, because homocysteine is not gonna be transformed by, by BHMT. So we measure uh, homocysteine in plasma and in liver, and it was high. So this is probably causing some stress in the animal. But this hormone, uh, FGF21, was also up. And this hormone, it's been very, very promising in, um, ob in obesity treatment because it, uh, it's actually driving the, the um, modification of these cells. So this is the model that, that we think that it's happening. 
homocysteine, in our model, homocysteine is high. It's causing some ER stress. Um, it's releasing this hormone called FGF21, and these fat deposits are actually becoming more like a muscle cell. So I gave you a general view about what Colin is doing, some models that we are using in the lab, uh, some human studies that we are doing in the institute, but I don't want to give the wrong impression. Adults also need choline. This is not only during pregnancy, this is not only for kids, this is not only if you are over-exercising or doing some training. And there are some um, studies, like, um, uh, like this one from uh, 2011, where um, a higher choline intake or choline supplementation was associated with better cognitive performance. And this was in adults between 36 and 80, um, 83 years old. And also, this is a, um, a very interesting study where that showed that choline intake prevents uh, age-related -rela memory decline and protects uh, from changes associated to Alzheimer's. So there are some models now going on trying to study why during Alzheimer's, during choline supplementation, it's uh, making it slower that transition to the disease. I hope you are wondering if you are eating enough choline. <laughs> after all this that I have told. So if you ask me, can I go to the doctor, like I go and have my glucose test or my triglycerides or something, and that the doctor can tell me if I'm eating enough choline? The answer is no. There's no test so far. So we are doing, uh, my, my boss is uh, leading this study, we are trying to develop a choline biomarker in humans. So we are feeding different uh, foods, high or low in choline, and, no, and the participants are giving us some samples, plasma samples, urine samples, and we are doing some tests, muscle tests and microbiome tests, and we are trying to figure out a marker to tell if uh, humans are eating enough choline or not. So by January, we are gonna have around 50, 60 participants, and we're gonna start to analyze our results, and very soon we will know if we can develop a marker for calling status. Saying that, I just wanna say thank you to all my lab and all the people who's working in, in the calling uh, the calling group, and with that, visit us at the Nutrition Research Institute. Thank you. Yes, um, actually we, sh we recently, recently published that it's through a microRNA, so it changes in, a, in a, the expression of m one microRNA, MIR129, that it's causing also changes at, at histone level uh, from this polycom group, and we're going to all the molecular detail about how specifically choline is stuck into these microRNAs, but I didn't show any related to the MIRs. Mm -hmm. Basically, the, the box that you have in your table, okay. it has choline. This red, this red box, oh. I just open it. And it has, I'm not selling this, by the way. <laughs> so, but with this supplement, it has here um, 550 milligrams of choline. So right. taking what, one table of, of, of uh, this, mm -hmm. you will be meeting the amount of choline that, the that you need, the entire, the yes, the, uh -huh, the, the, daily, the daily requirement. But is deficiency somewhere Mm -hmm. so um, in, in yellow is the adequate intake. So the adequate intake for men, for instance, it will be about 550 milligrams. 
and what uh, men are actually taking, it's around 320. Mm -hmm. And um, during lactation, it's actually the more dramatic because the requirement during lactation, it's 550, more or less what a men uh, requirements are, and women are, are taking same, around 300, plus sending all the calin to the, to the baby and to the milk to meet the amount of calin that the baby needs. So the women are, ver uh, it's very, are very deficient during lactation. So is, is that reflected in the current dietary guidelines by the U.S.? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. You had the, the little five-day window, whatever it was, in the mice for the eye development. Mm -hmm. You also had the two curves for the, the brain development. Is there any evidence that once you're past that uh, deficiency, that growth phase where it incorporated that you can actually supplement and go back and change the, the, the eye development and so forth, or is that done forever? We did that too. We did postnatal supplementation, and then we did retinographies. What retinographies are, it's gonna measure all the signals that are given towards the brain. And actually, postnatal uh, calling supplementation helped a lot. It didn't recover fully to the ones that were uh, meeting the, the uh, adequate intake, but it was, um, it was recovered partially. Uh, you, can, you can check that paper three months ago from FACEF. It's already published. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? I have a question. Yes. So with this slide, mm -hmm. it's not really segmented. So I guess I, I would say the turn I would have mm -hmm. is there's a call it a trend. And certainly in the in the U.S., I think probably in Europe as well, with uh, especially teenage girls moving more towards vegetarian, vegan type diets. Is that is there any research looking at that? Is that going to uh, is, is this a discrepancy between intake and requirement getting larger? What are the implications of that? Um, I guess that we will know in the next. Um Questionary. It's it's every every two years. There's a big questionary sent, sent out, and families answer that questionary, and then we get the, that data from there. What we do know is that vegetarian diets are usually uh, calling deficient. So uh, what we usually say is, if you take a supplement, you will be meeting the the requirement. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank There's you very much. One last question. Yes, sure. This is, what, this is something we always talked about. So is there any, if you're taking a supplement, mm -hmm. bioavailability of a supplement versus what you're getting in, say meat, milk, mm -hmm. or eggs, mm -hmm. uh, or grains, um, any differences there or fairly available mm -hmm. in terms of supplement? Uh, since it's a water-soluble vitamin, it's very available. Uh, some people like to do better dimethylglycine, the, the next step of choline, mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, side effect is this fishy odor and people don't like to have that fishy odor, of course. So actually, the viability uh, of choline bitrate is really good, and it has no side effects. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. All right, please give a round of applause.